Hello everybody and welcome back to Air Tycoon 5 World Domination. Um, it's only been a little bit of in-game time since the last episode where you can see the good old economic crisis sitting right back here, but um, our company's doing pretty well in that. I've been making a lot of routes with um, A310 300s or 767-200s. As you guys can see, these two are rapidly catching up in the like, number of aircraft to um, 707s or 747s, which were my primary fleet types before with, you know, two plus being the slot occupiers. As you can see, a lot of them are being kind of cashed back in into slots. So a lot of these are sitting around doing literally nothing. Um, but yeah, on another note, um, I'm just here, you know, just kind of pass some turns and make some routes with you guys, I guess. Um, just kind of show what I've been up to because uh, I might play a lot representing a lot of time past. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm going to be making a lot of, like, episodes, because it's going to be a lot of the same thing. Um, right now, what I'm doing is, I don't want to say kind of boring, but it's all very, uh, similar in the sense that it, it's just making stopover routes and abusing stopover routes. That's, that's basically the plan here. Um, and yeah, we're just going to be involving cities where I know... Uh, there's still a little bit of demand available. Like, this this looks pretty capped out, right? Um, but there's tons of cities in the middle like this, um, which do not have routes to them yet. And they're still plenty, plenty profitable when you use something like an A310 as a stopover. The A310 is just freaking fantastic for this purpose of making low demand stopovers or medium demand stopovers. Like, because just about any route under the sun you can find um is a profitable and uh is a profitable route which is going to be 100 percent load factor so yeah this is basically why i've been choosing to use the a310 um it's incredibly easy to use it's extremely flexible and i think in real life to be honest let's talk about some airplanes for a bit is uh the a310 was extremely underrated in my opinion um i kind of feel like it was an earlier generation 787 in terms of it was to be honest a near perfect for like the at the time technologies for a low demand uh point to point aircraft right and it didn't work at all i think it sold like less than 200 like just around 200 aircraft um which is terrible for you know a, a fleet type i mean like 737s i think the max for example sold 4000 like um, prior to the crashes, I'm not sure if that's still true. Neos, Air A320 Neos sell thousands. Um, A350s are probably in like six, seven hundred, eight hundred range. Um, and there's probably also been just thousands upon thousands of. Oh, what that includes one of my existing routes. Uh, there's probably been thousands and thousands of uh like seven eight seven uh orders. Um, like I'm sure I'm, I'm, I don't know the exact numbers, but I know there's been a lot. Um, so yeah, 180 was not a good amount of orders. And I really think it came before it's time because from an engineering point of view, I think it's a very good aircraft. It's small, it's efficient, um, and it could serve, uh, kind of long haul point to point travel and it didn't really work out really well. Now I have no facts or actual data to back this up. Um, but just from a kind of like aviation fan's perspective, it almost kind of seems like the A310's failure spurred on the production of the A380 because the Airbus probably looked at the sales and be like, okay, clearly nobody gives a shit about point-to-point -point travel. Um, so instead, let's go for uh, the opposite and just, you know, like C747s are still selling great while our A310 did terribly. Um, it was clearly hubs, hub travel is where it's at. We need to build the new main flagship, you know, hub to hub connector, basically the A380. And obviously that didn't work very well either. Um, but okay, like I don't want to insult any, any aviation fans here, but from my perspective, from what I can tell, Airbus actually, in my opinion, quite reliably out engineers Airbus. Um, their planes are are better engineered for the tasks that are meant to serve, but they just don't seem to have the same level of read on the market um, 
as Boeing does. Like the 787 um, was a great read on the market that, you know, point to point flying could finally become economical enough and uh, airlines would realize that at the same time and all that stuff. Um, while the A310 came just a bit too early uh, before its time. And then the 747, of course, was what defined, uh, I guess, long haul hub to hub travel for the longest time before it was eventually kind of uh, fallen out of favor for point to point planes. And, you know, hub to hub travel could also be done by much more efficient planes, just like, um, I mean, for example, the 777 uh, 9X holds 600 people. So, like, at that size, the importance of, you know, uh, like the 747 is basically nothing. I, mean, I think the 747 has some 50 higher max capacity than the uh, uh, 9X. And, yeah, like, I'm, I'm not really sure when that ever really comes into play. Uh, so, yeah, basically with that in mind, um, I certainly know that the future is point-to-point -point travel. But I also know that this game does not care about point-to-point um, -point versus hubs uh, travel because none of transfers are not modeled. And to be honest, I don't know of a single air, uh, airline simulator where passenger transfers are accurately modeled. And that is a thing I kind of want to work on myself. Is like I, I don't really want to program a complete game, all right? A complete game is just a bit too big for me. I'm not sure if I can manage... Um, that many things. That's not really my goal, but I'm kind of curious just if I was able to program something that could model passenger transfers because I've been thinking about this, all right? I have a pretty decent idea uh, for how I could model uh, world passenger travel for an airline simulator without um, doing too much work myself, all right? So the first thing I need is data, of course, right? There's tons and tons of data, and it's easily available on Wikipedia, for example. I could easily write a little script or something to pull it off there. And wow, we're running out of routes and I want to make, so let's go ahead and look for a new hub like Houston. And then, yeah, there's tons of untaken cities. So, like, for example, so what data would I use from Wikipedia to actually generate passenger numbers? Well, there's two ways to do it. You could either, like, I think you probably need in-industry connections, but... You, the best and most accurate way to find passenger data would be to find actual passenger data from airlines, add it all up, figure out where it's going, and that would be one way to do it. But of course, that requires connections I do not have. Um, plus, yeah, that would that would be a little bit difficult. But what you can find quite easily available on the internet is things like economic data, GDPs. Um, uh, you can find... Uh, for example, how big the tourism industry is. Uh, and you can use all these things um, put together to kind of create a kind of accurate model of passenger travel is uh, with tourism numbers, GDP numbers, and uh, all these things, you could create a pretty good model. Now, it would be missing some things, for example, like cultural connections. Uh, what do I mean by that is like, um, for example, London Heathrow, my favorite example airport. Um, London Heathrow, or like London in general, or the United Kingdom, let's let's go even more general, has a lot of demand to other Commonwealth countries. So like um, Canada, uh, or former Commonwealth, or like English-speaking countries, it has pr quite high demand to the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, um these are actual in real life passenger numbers, by the way, not in game. And uh, India, for example. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. Everyone can understand, all right, you know, these, those are former English colonies. People speak English. They tend to travel between like places. Now, that's one way to recognize uh, tourism travel. But for example, you'll find that a lot of other popular destinations from, from uh, London, for example, Thailand, like it's quite a popular destination from London, but it's not like, wh where's the cultural connection? There's no language connection. And what I realized is consistently, uh, maybe like depending on where people are in the world, look for different things, but high GDP areas. So basically rich people, um, United States, 
uh, most of Western Europe, they all tend to favor traveling towards um, uh, tourist destinations. And basically, how do you recognize a tourist destination? Well, I, I, w I would guess, I'm not sure if this would work well, but the best way to recognize it appears to be countries with a high percentage of a relatively low GDP is tourism, um, as tourism. So, for example, a lot of Caribbean countries or uh, maybe a couple South American countries or uh, places like Thailand, for example, have uh, or Iceland, for example, another great example, would have a very high percentage of their GDP based on tourism. And I could give these places a multiplier, basically, which multiplies their traffic, even though they don't have very high GDP. Another thing is high GDP areas of the world would have high demand to each other. Um, I think this just makes sense. There's a lot of economic ties and specifically like these areas would have a lot of business travel. So, for example, uh, the United States and Europe, um, specifically, say, London is a very economically active area or the United Kingdom in general, would have a very, very high demand um, to other areas of the world with very high um, economic power. So, for example, Singapore and Hong Kong, these would be destinations to uh, London, which by my model would have very high demand. And, for example, places which are both considered tourist areas would not. So, for example, a Caribbean place um, and... Uh, what's another uh, touristy location? Um, and Thailand, for example, would not have particularly high uh, connections between each other. Or Hawaii, which has a very high uh, percentage of tourism, for example, would have um, pretty high uh, t traffic to rich areas, but not other high tourism areas. Uh, and you know what? I, I don't really actually know right now off the top of my head where in the world has particularly high amounts of tourism. This would, of course, have to be stuff I, I kind of found out from the numbers. So, you know, with a combination of, you know, cultural connections, which I would just find through common languages, basically. You can find language data on the internet and a few other things. And then you can make a general kind of outline of which areas of the world to which other areas of the world uh, would have a high demand. Now, there are some issues with this model, um, but maybe there are kinks I'll be able to work out. All I have to make sure of is there's no hard coding involved. Like, um, here's one of the problems, for example. So the U.S. is a huge area. A lot of different areas of the U.S. behave very differently. So with that, you'd kind of need a population density map of the world, too, to find out um, which part of the country, of a rich country, the actual rich people, are, like, the people are in. You know what I mean? Like, um... You could see that freaking California and the East Coast of the U.S. Uh, has a high density of population, which, you know, could generate um, high values of business travelers and tourists and all, all sorts of good stuff. Uh, and which areas are less economically active, like freaking Wyoming. So even if there's a like freaking city in Wyoming, I wouldn't know what it was called. It wouldn't generate as high numbers as somewhere which might be in a more economically active region but that would that would just be basically stuff related to a population density map i'm not sure if it'd be too difficult to code in um the hardest part would really to be just finding the actual data itself um <clears throat> okay that was a really long ramble about some random stuff which i don't know if any of you guys actually care about but on another hand uh yeah, let's go ahead and open some routes to uh, Singapore. Singapore being a kind of underutilized hub I have. Um, I want to get that traffic up in all of my hubs. There's only 500 slots in Singapore, unfortunately. So these are going to run out very easily. Um, yeah, they're not going to last very long, but that's fine. Uh, instead, you know, I don't think we'll need like that many slots everywhere from here on out. Because it won't be long before my growth is so much faster than uh, competitor growth that basically I believe that I'll be able to buy all of them. Um, I'm not really sure what makes an airline go onto the M&A list. 
but it honestly appears to me like it's just when they reach a small enough fraction of my value, then I get the choice to buy them or not. I think that's how it works. The only reason why I'm guessing that is because, for example, Eurostar, you know, I don't want to buy it. I want to look at its routes. 319k profit. Bro, that's fantastic profit. Profit. In fact, that profit is almost as high as the number one player who has 337k. You know what I mean? Like, it's not, it's definitely not determined on their profit going negative. I don't think that's possible. That's what I thought it was initially. Um, but no, that's not how it works. Los Angeles and London is still my monopoly, by the way. <laughs> Which is freaking awesome. Um, as you can see how little money I'm making from a great route like Dallas and London having two leased 747s on it. That's probably not the smartest idea in hindsight, but you know what? That's pretty funny. Anyways, 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 anyways. We need to go ahead and buy some aircraft. I think I'm running low on routes, which can be flown on an A310 on base range. So maybe I should use a range boosted A310. Let me find out how expensive it is to range boost an A310. Uh, A310, 300. And 13,000. So to reach the range of a 787 or 767, we can't even reach the range of that, but we do become much more efficient, um, which is something to look at. This is a 8.9 efficiency aircraft, which is pretty ridiculous. And at 8.9 efficiency, even the 10 seats smaller might make it a better deal. Uh... Yeah, I think this is better than a 767. Um, uh, I'm not sure, though. I'm not sure, though. Let's take a look at the 767. Ooh, we got the 767-300, which is a significantly better aircraft. Uh, I don't think I want to start buying those yet, though, because right now I just want to fill out all the routes I can. Um... So a base 767, I get 10 more seats and far less fuel efficiency. Let's look at how much fuel a 767 actually typically uses and how much my A310s are typically making. Uh, here's an A310. Um, as you guys can see, their, their profitability is still going up as the routes kind of accelerate. They make around, it looks like five, four to 5K, but closer to 5K. And if I take a look at 767s, I'm not sure we'll see a significant difference. Here we are. Yeah, it looks very similar. Um, yeah, no noticeable difference. So it just seems like I'll be getting a lot more efficiency out of the uh, the other, the, the A310. The fuel cost is tiny anyway, so I'm not sure I should even consider that, but... Yeah, the fuel cost is tiny, so I shouldn't consider that. Uh, so this, then, I'd be paying more for a far more efficient plane, or slightly less for a far more efficient plane. So I think I'll go with the A310 range boosted um, instead of the 767. Like, this is 10 seats less for, like, 20% fuel efficiency. Uh... Mm, I think that the... I'm struggling here. I think I'll go with a single range boost, and that should cover a lot of the things I want to do. Um, yeah, I think this is the actual sweet spot: is a single range boost, and you just save we saving some money on using a actual seven six seven, and then later on when we need some longer range, even we'll use the seven six seven. And did I remember to buy fuel? Yes, I did. So we can go ahead and just place this order. Uh, there we go. Perfect. Then we can uh, set the price. I can't remember if I did already, but better safe than sorry. Uh, because letting these things fill up without doing this is a nightmare. Because you either just have like one. Alright, so I can't remember if I confirmed that. We'll just confirm it again. And then we'll throw in a save. Nice, nice, nice. And then we can go ahead and pass the turn. And 1.65 billion, that's a little bit disappointing to be honest. I was hoping for a lot more than that. <clears throat> I mean, with the amount of new nice profitable routes I'm opening, 
that is a little bit disappointing. And it looks like my 707s have hit an annoying breakpoint. Um, basically, their satisfaction has dropped so that they can no longer be full. <laughs> um, that's a pain. Uh, let me think if I can fix that in any way. Uh, 22% satisfaction. How much would it cost to renovate these guys? Uh, 3 million is not that bad, but how much satisfaction would I get? <laughs> 37. Okay, that's hopeless. Um, yeah, I'll just look forward to be replacing those planes uh, pretty soon with A310s or or the likes. Um, yeah, I think an A310 would be the best option for replacing those guys. But anyways, guys, this episode's kind of dragging on, so I'm going to take a break and I'll be right back. All right, guys, I join back with you and look at this 1.87 billion a turn okay well that's pretty high but to be honest i was expecting better um yeah so let's go ahead and make that higher i guess you know we just hitting up these you know pretty classic stopover routes and yeah this is probably gonna push us uh i mean each plane is basically pushing us a few k higher so, with enough of them, you know, we're finally going to be hitting that uh, 2 billion mark we've been looking for. I haven't been to 2 billion net profit in this game for so freaking long. Um, you know, I also can't remember the last time I hit 2 billion a turn. It must have been the highest I've ever seen in this game. I think is very close to 5 billion a turn. I think I've seen over 4 billion. I believe that was an Air Tycoon Online 2 where you could have about a 50% margin cut down by tax. Um, the Air Tycoon 2 had the best margins in the game because the pricing was 1.6 instead of 1.3. Um, so yeah, you can imagine the difference that makes uh, <laughs> making, you know, like what what is that? Almost 25% more per route? Yeah, that's about 25% more per route. So you can imagine the difference that makes when you multiply that by uh, thousands and thousands of routes um, yeah, it was a lot easier to hit high profit in uh, air tycoon online 2 um, then 3 3 is a lot more difficult i think the 3 is the, definitely the hardest air tycoon to ever come out um you know, this shit is honestly not easy at all to make a profit whatsoever to be honest um i guess if you're small in this game it is easy to make a high margin like i don't know 20 30 percent but it's really hard to get to the margins that we're talking about that we saw in like previous air tycoons which is you know pretty interesting look at that i'm just kind of curious to see how a route like that would be doing in a time like this uh so yeah we just we just continuing on you know like not much to think about really um but yeah what other like things can i can i say like I remember that in uh, freaking Air Tycoon Online 1, I hit 3 billion on my literal first game world ever. Um, and I hit 3 billion extremely early. I think about, about this time. And basically, I was in one of the first Air Tycoon Online worlds ever. My friend had just discovered the game. He was like, yo, 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 let's hit this game up. And I was like, sure. And uh, I figured out the game extremely quickly. Like, the fact that basically this is still the case but the most important things were monopoly and then the size of the route in terms of business and tour so basically for me it was really fun because it was basically let's look around the world and then find the biggest um the biggest cities so it was like you know first of course at that time there was no hubbing system so you could you could open a route wherever so the first thing another thing you'd have to figure out is ignore hubs entirely and just open routes in the order you find them, which is biggest to smallest. Um, so yeah, that was really awesome in that sense where um, I was basically like, all right, here's a route. And then here's New York to London. And now here's freaking um, Amsterdam to fucking Bangkok. You know what I mean? It was like, just like anything in a random order. And it really, really worked for me. Um, yeah, like, like you didn't care about hubs. You didn't care about... Uh, what else did you not care about? Oh, yeah, you didn't care for competition. That's one of the first things I discovered. 
just like for example new york to london in that game had like i don't know 10 15 layers of competition why would you bother just open any other route um and yeah it was freaking great but um yeah also that was also the highest world traveler index i had ever seen in a world was that very world uh, the first Air Tycoon 1 world I played, I think the World Traveler Index reached 5.6 thousand at the end. Uh, to put that in perspective, Fukuoka at that size is as big as Toronto is now. Or is, is bigger than Amsterdam is now. That's how big the world got. So basically, um, what happened in that world is well, I stopped playing. Which is a big shame. Like I stopped playing until the late 2000s. My value had deflated from i don't know probably about 300 million to about 100 million in that time just you know running old ass planes and then i actually managed to recover it and finish you know exactly 10th place so it was a shame because that could have been my first i don't know it'd probably be a second place finish because i don't know who had already discovered that airports were the best thing ever and there was one person i remember i think it was called they were called nav air and oh my god nav air had already figured out airports were the best so I don't think, I don't know why he did this, but he never in the entire game bought a single aircraft. I don't know how he bought his first airport, um, but he did. And yeah, he just literally played with airports the whole game. He owned basically every airport uh, because most other players, of course, at that time did not know airports were so strong. And not only did they not know airports were so strong, um, there are very few credit users back then. So, yeah, he finished with also the highest value I have yet seen to date in any Air Tycoon world. But, I mean, we can only assume that's because um, he had figured something out that nobody else had, which was uh, airports are OP. And he had, I believe, basically literally every major airport in the world. And I don't know how much per turn that would generate, but I can tell you something is that it would be a completely nutty and mental amount of money um yeah so that was that guy and yeah unfortunately i've never gotten to beat in his record but i probably will like unofficially this is offline so i mean it doesn't really count but mm, i what i'm doing now would be completely possible with offline air tycoon offline or online i mean <laughs> jesus um in fact it'd be quite easy with those bonuses you get from uh, from being a quote-unquote uh, VIP or whatever. Yep. Uh, let's cancel more close-range Paris routes. Because I feel like I want to finish off Paris and London in general. Like, there's some cities left to Paris and London. But, you know, let's go ahead and like, literally make sure that count is basically nothing um i guess i'll do london first let's do london first so london let's make sure this episode isn't going too too long i don't mind if it's long uh cologne delete this route and what else can we delete can we delete einhofen let's delete this one all right, that should make enough slots for me to basically make everything to London. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, and it looks like we've already gotten pretty, like, that is too small <laughs> for even to London. Like, that was, like, what was that, like, combined? How is that an international airport even? Like, but, like, yeah, I'm just going to do, like, like, everything even somewhat reasonably sized, just not as small as that last city to London. Uh, so we'll start with like the Horn of Africa, you know, just take all of these routes to London and then from London to, you know, anything we can find with an airport, basically, except for that, like, uh, that town I just saw somewhere over there with like 30 business and 30 tour, uh, but like Casper, Sheridan, like, yeah, Sheridan, that, that guy is not, or Aberdeen, you're also too small. Jesus, there's so many airports in the U.S., with just unbelievably horrible business and tour. But they somehow have an airport. So, you know, how can I even judge? Um, like, these kind of routes, I'll always want to be the smallest airplane possible. I mean, I'm basically only making these routes just because I love London. Um, because, you know, it has it has a home in my heart. 
thanks to being, you know, the first overpowered airport I discovered. Um, so, yeah. That an airport? Sweet. Well, now it's connected to London. <laughs> yeah, literally everything is going to get connected to London here. Um, Tallahassee? Hey, Tallahassee has an airport now. So, we can do Tallahassee to London. Then to, you know, something over here. Brazzaville, no airport. Luanda has an airport. Getting connected to London. <laughs> These are getting four schedules a week, too, which is very nice. Um, how rare to London. Hey, I remember this is what I ended up doing in one of my first Air Tycoon Worlds. Is basically, um, I, cu I couldn't, like, uh, I, I didn't really know, like, how to play very well back then. So I didn't invest in another city to get another base early enough. So basically, I only had one hub for the longest time, right? And of course, being me, that was London. And I ended up with literally everything to London. And when I mean literally everything, I mean literally everything. If it was a city, it was connected to London. Uh, if it had an airport. And I remember freaking using all these silly, hard to remember <laughs> African airports as well. Um, I really don't know what I used on the other side of the stopover. I mean, oh wow, there's... All of these cities with no airports before are finally getting airports, so that's nice. We can connect them up. Uh, do you guys see any unused cities? Well, I do now. Bridgetown and Rossau will connect these boys to London as well. Here, that's a bit far south, so I'm going to have to look for something over here. That works. <laughs> This is why A310s are brilliant, is I can do this, and I'm almost certain the route will be full. Uh, is there anything in here which isn't already connected to London? Okay, well, this little city is not, and now it is. Do I have any more slots? Wow, I still have plenty of slots, actually. All right, I'm really, really running out of routes now, huh? Let's take a look in this area of the world and see if there's anything missing Ooh, jackson jackson is tiny i don't even know if i want to do that let's not do that yet uh bloomington great we can connect that to london now uh buffalo and rochester okay rochester looks like a pretty decent route not connected to london in fact the ais have even connected it to something so that's impressive um Let's check this area of the world out. Looks like it's been pretty thoroughly taken. Uh, except for here, actually. It seems that I have missed. Uh, where am I out of slots? Definitely London. So let's go and uh, get some of those London slots. Uh, Cologne? Nope. I, I can't even see anymore which is the problem whether the route exists or not so that's a bit difficult um also looks like we have these two random korean cities and pyongyang <laughs> let's do pyongyang actually let's not do pyongyang first it's the smallest i'll do it later but boy we got the koreans in house too yo uh dar es salam all right that's that's a route um <laughs> Yeah, this is becoming a real struggle for routes. Uh, okay, that's a bit small. Brazzaville, no airport. Okay, Malabo. No, you are being connected to London as well. And then, thanks to this being far north, I think this will work. Sweet. Um, <laughs> all right. That's all the A310s. And <laughs> look at how much more money we have for even more of them. Oh, gosh. So... Yeah, set the prices right and pass the turn, and that should be basically the end of the episode. I'll probably play a lot off camera. Um, I mean, it's going to be more of the same thing. More A310s, more cities. Um, yeah, basically, basically more of the same. And yeah, so we have cash. We have that, and then all we need to do is put in an order for planes. So uh, I think I'm going to get... A singularly range boosted 767 200s and just connect this to a lot of different places that i haven't been able to go yet uh 
yeah, I think, I think that's a good idea. So, yeah. Anyways, with that in mind, hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.